Bah. Goodbye, little sheep. So I just watched the September 2022 JW broadcasting and I got so upset that I yelled at the TV and I basically marched in here and just decided to kind of record a rant about it a little bit. Normally when I do these rebuttals, I try to be really measured and I do multiple takes and I, I try to be very succinct to my points. No such luxuries now. I'm mad. I'm in total bitter apostate mode. So if you're looking for like nuanced criticisms that are like not swayed by emotion too much, it, sorry, no. That's not going to be this. And there will be minimal editing effort. No, sorry. Minimal editing effort. Just this last week, so like a day ago, what did they call it? Yesterday, the Watchtower study uh, talked about avoiding apostate stuff. And uh, I just released a video on an article that witnesses are going to be studying in November about avoiding apostate stuff. And then now, the September uh, <laughs> issue of the show of JW Broadcasting got it in one is all about avoiding negative talk things that people say about uh, what we're doing or not doing in the news but there's something like particularly smug and insipid about this particular episode and i just i gotta rant about it i gotta be mad because here's the thing about the bitter apostate stereotype uh, it's totally valid to be bitter that you were raised in a cruel and controlling religion and as a result of leaving that religion your parents shun you that's as good of a reason to be bitter as I can think of, but we tend to not allow ourselves to show that because, oh, what if the witnesses see? They could be stumbled. Witnesses can be stumbled by the existence of Harry Potter, okay? They're, they're, they're fine. They'll be okay. They got to go on their own journey. So let's get into this. I'm going to be upset and mad. I might have I might have had a little sip of something before I started recording. By sip, I mean like a theme for this program is as Jehovah Sheep reject the voice of strangers. Now, if you wondered how clueless Watchtower is about how they are perceived by the outside world, they sent Stephen Lett to do this little bit of PR for them. Like, okay, we're going to have to talk about Celia uh, later in the broadcast. Who's the least creepy guy to say that kind of sentence? I know, the guy whose face is like that. Your exaggerated facial expressions and condescending tone just scream, we are a normal bunch of guys. People are starting to leave because they have this perception that we're a cult. Who should we send out to, uh, you know, really put our best face forward? Did someone say biggest face forward? The theme for this program is, as Jehovah sheep reject the voice of strangers. It's estimated that there may be 15 million animal species on Earth today. But of all these animals, which one is most often used in the Bible to represent good people? Sheep, 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 sheep. So he starts with like, well, what's an animal? Well, phylum animalia species mammalia, and we go on and so forth until we get to the lowly sheep. <laughs> and uh, it's just kind of amazing because one of the things that uh, they're going to be getting into with this is like there's all of this you know negative talk about the organization and how we're so weird and controlling and if the first thing that we want to get off our chest right off the bat is you guys need to be more like sheep you know that famous expression about not being one reverse it right back at you you're a sheep now and you follow my little stick which is the broadcast <laughs> a crook is it a shepherd's crook I want to be a shepherd just so I can have a, a crook. Jesus often uses this illustration. Jesus repeats himself a whole hell of a lot, doesn't he? I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Why did Jesus use a sheep illustration to represent people who will gain everlasting life? Undoubtedly, because of the desirable qualities literal sheep have. They're gregarious having a liking for companionship. They don't like to be alone. And it's a good thing. They're defenseless if a lion or bear approaches. About all they can do is bleat. Bah. Goodbye, little sheep. Bah. Bah. The whole message of this is very overtly, you need to be a follower and stop questioning stuff that we're saying. Don't be a questioner, don't be a critic, be a follower. 
that means good person. Be Jehovah's friend. Sheep is good in Bible. You be good Bible sheep. <laughs> I try not to engage in kind of conspiratorial stuff, but there's a tone of this that is almost braggy. It's a little taunting towards apostates. And hey, pff, I took the bait, so... <laughs> <laughs> but I say braggy in the sense that there is this obviously very condescending tone. He is kind of, Stephen Lett is kind of the face of cringe governing body stuff. I, I think that they are somewhat aware of the perception of them. I, not necessarily the governing body themselves, but like the teaching committee and writing committee guys. He's also going to directly call back to something that is one of the most criticized things uh, that's been said by a governing body member in recent years. And they're very specifically going to refer to the main thing they're criticized for by apostates like myself and totally twist the logic and uh, thereby lying by omission. Um, so it, it feels a little cruel and vindictive. Like it, it, it felt like uh, kind of thumbing the nose at folks like myself, even though probably it isn't. It felt like that. And I, for some reason, want to explore these feelings on camera with you. Like and subscribe. Another good quality is that sheep as a whole tend to be peaceful, inoffensive, very different from goats. <laughs> They're inoffensive, very different from goats. As we all know, goats are very offensive. Goats are the only truth tellers we have left in this society. As little boys, my brother and I would pet the goats that my grandfather had. But if we turned our backs on them, one would often sneak up behind us and butt us, but, 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 butt us. I would think about these sorts of things if I'm in the production team of JW Broadcasting. I would think maybe like, do we want to make something that is going to get clipped where a governing body member just says the word but while doing this gesture? But, like, but. like I feel like you wouldn't necessarily want to just give us a free but, but or, I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody hates him in the video department and they're like, like encouraging him to do this. Like, no, you should tell the story that you, you always do that. What's that fun gesture you do with your arm? Tell that one on camera. But, but, but. but also very deeply creepy. And again, talking to people like they're preschoolers, like this really is a cadence that I, I notice I only hear in these kinds of videos. It, it's really strange. I don't ever hear anybody speak like this. Uh, even when listening to like professional speakers or like college lectures, this is not generally considered good public speaking by any stretch of the imagination, and yet this is what their teaching books that they write, this is how they want you to talk and act. Like, this is a model of good teaching. And I just think that's kind of amazing that because this guy's weird, everybody has to be weird. Obviously, this kind of stilted, lifeless, condescending language didn't start with him, but I do feel like there is a tendency now within the talks to adopt this overly simplistic and condescending cadence. These are some of the desirable characteristics that make sheep an appropriate illustration for good people. Now, uh, I came to check out your sheep, but do you have any with desirable characteristics? Sir, I don't, I'm sure I don't know what you mean. Uh, you mean like they're, I mean, they got wool on them. No, no, I mean, Desirable. Are you saying a different word? It sounds like you're spelling it with like an like an O in the middle somehow. Desirable with a capital I right in the middle. I'm just biding time because he's reading a scripture and I don't, fucking, I don't fucking care about the Bible. Read your old favorite book. Read your book. He likes it when he reads the book. So what's the desirable quality? Sheep listen to the voice of their shepherd and reject the voice of strangers. Regarding this quality of sheep, the September 1st, 2004 Watchtower said this. <laughs> this is good. This is good sourcing. So first of all, in order to back up a scientific fact about sheep, which you'd think they'd be like, I don't know, National Geographic kids.com uh no like okay uh, this fact about sheep was found in a watchtower of 2004 and the opening line of the thing that they're quoting quotes a different thing like as it was once said as it was once said the, you know like it just um uh, stupid they're, they're bad at what they do Actually, the thing is, I think they're kind of good at what they do, and that's part of the reason why I'm a little bit salty about this broadcast. Please ask yourself, as one of Jehovah's figurative sheep, do I obediently respond 
to the voice of the fine shepherd and flee from the voice of strangers? So here's the thing. It's like, listen to the voice of God, right? Listen to Jehovah's voice. When you're a witness, that just seems very obvious. Like, of course, why would I never not listen to Jehovah's voice? And how does Jehovah speak to us again? Uh, well, I guess through the Bible, but uh, are you just allowed to interpret that for yourself? Or do it's the faithful and discreet slave, right? So the voice of God, listen to your shepherd's voice. Witnesses aren't claiming divine revelations. They don't have one-on-one -on -one conversations with Jesus. And weirdly, the governing body don't either, which I always thought was dumb. Like if they don't even talk to God, then why the hell are we listening to them? But yeah, when I, when I would talk to my parents and I would tell them that I'm not leaving Jehovah, I'm leaving the organization, you know, it was impossible for them to separate one from the other in their heads even as they were trying to separate them, I would say to them, you think that Jehovah and the organization are the same? They'd say, no, we don't. And I would say, so you think that I can serve Jehovah without the organization? They would say, no, <laughs> because they are the same. You cannot have one without the other. Jehovah doesn't give a shit about your stupid worship. Lame, mm, you didn't read the right little pamphlet with the pictures. You have to worship the way his fe favorite fellas do it, and they're mostly American white dudes. Hmm. So, so much of this sounds intuitive when you're a witness because you're like, well, of course, I'll listen to Jehovah's voice. But I think the thing that got me to start questioning was, like, wait a minute, Jehovah's not telling me to not look up stuff on the internet. I I'm pretty sure that's these guys. And when I started to realize that these guys could be lying, and how would I know if they were? Uh, that's when I started to read things a little differently. So as much as I think this is going to scare a lot of people, especially people who are teetering, uh, the demo that they do later I think could be really effective at keeping people in. Credit where credit is due, you bastards. Um, but I think if you are teetering, it's also equally likely that you will be like, whoa, this is so manipulative. Surely it's not as black and white as this. Uh, so I, with all of these things, I, I tend to think that it's hard to blame one single talk on waking people up or getting people to go further in because depending on where you're at in your journey, anything can do that, right? You're at a really sensitive space where you're desperately trying to justify what you already believe. So if you can find a way to do that when listening to a talk like this, your brain is going to accept that before it's going to accept the alternative. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of rambling here because I, I'm grappling with like the ramifications of stuff like this. When I watch this, I think about my friends and I think like, what what are they thinking? And of course, selfishly, I'm like, what are they thinking about me? Are they like, mm-hmm, yeah, look, that's what happened to Jake. I don't want to end up like that guy. To be fair to them, I don't know that this is the picture of uh, excellence right now, but I don't know, man, I'm having a pretty good time. Come hang out sometime. I really want to play Super Smash Brothers. I was always so much better at it than all of you watching. The original stranger was Satan the devil. Like a ventriloquist, he made a serpent appear to talk. But the words were Satan's words. Satan thereby used his voice to slander Jehovah and deceive Eve. Today, Satan continues his work as an evil ventriloquist using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice, these acting as his agents, either wittingly or unwittingly. No puppet, States, no puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's I just was talking to a JW apologist who, they, they do exist, sometimes they email me. And he was arguing that, no, 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 that watchtower, if, if you haven't seen my last video, it's about a watchtower that's pretty similar to what we're about to watch. And he's like, no, no, that watchtower wasn't saying that Satan speaks through the media. And uh, of course, this is a thing that I've speculated about on the show many times. Um, but this is actually, I think, pretty important and pretty gross because in directly saying that Satan used a snake like a puppet, and now he does that with humans, wittingly or unwittingly, that means that somebody could be a puppet of Satan without even knowing it. So now I have to think that that's what my parents think I am, and you know what? And you, when you really think about it, maybe it's just because I've had a couple of like, <laughs> how would I know, man? Like if the whole world was just made up of a bunch of Satan puppets, and that was like our perception of reality, bro. Like 
we wouldn't even fucking know. Did you ever think about this shit? I think this is going to come up potentially even in future court cases or litigation or investigations of them, Netflix, whatever is right. They now have a quote of the guy saying that Satan uses these things as his puppet. And that kind of is going to make it difficult for any judge or jury uh, to view them with any kind of respect. Like, you think about the Alex Jones trial that just happened, and one of the things they did was they played clips of him talking about how the members of the jury were being controlled by Satan or were secret, uh, you know, whatever, New World Order agents. And um, that was played before the court. And, you know, Alex Jones didn't come out looking super good. And yeah, the jury did not rule in his favor. So anyway, these kind of things come back to bite them. Uh, whenever you watch a documentary that comes out about them, they always have a fresh batch of horrifying out-of-context Watchtower quotes that make them look bad. So that's another copium point and I'm going to give myself is that this does give us a lot of really funny things. But, 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 but. but now let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing, but Satan's underlings or strangers tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. Our fine shepherd tells us as our first example, these words at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919, and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. It actually didn't really strike me until now rewatching this that it, it's a bit of a genius retcon, the 1919 thing, that that period of inspection that Jesus was doing. Because one of the issues that critics, especially who like to use the Bible, point out about the faithful and discreet slave interpretation that Watchtower has, beyond it just being very obviously self-serving, is that uh, it says that it's dependent on the faithful servant being faithful when the master comes and inspects him. And he better be careful that he not become the evil or wicked slave. And so one thing that uh, you'll hear people say, and I think it's a great point, and it can be a really powerful one, is that if it was, if the governing body were the wicked slave, how would you know, right? And I think anybody who is earnestly engaging with some questions, that that's going to be hard. But I never, I actually never saw what Watchtower was trying to do with the 1919 thing, which was to get ahead of that criticism and be like, oh, don't worry. That inspection, that actually already happened in, in 1919. Turns out, clean bill of health, the health inspector, Jesus, came by and said, no roaches in the fryers, so we got an A+. Plus. So we weren't the evil slave, and now that inspection's over, and he will never reassess. We're fine forever, the governing body. It's kind of the once saved, always saved doctrine, but for the governing body. <laughs> so what's the implication? Obviously, even now. Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. Ah, the governing body, they should strive to do the same. Now, the thing is, is that there's actually no checks and balances on the governing body, except the invisible one, and they get to speak for him now. So. Uh, if somebody in the governing body wasn't measuring up, uh, we would have no way of knowing about it because they would probably handle that from within. And that's pretty different from how any of the rest of us in the Jehovah's Witness organization would have been treated. But what does the voice of strangers say on this subject? Don't trust the faithful slave. He will mislead you. And who often have the loudest voice promoting this false message? apostates. Hebrews 13.9 labels false messages as strange teachings. Yes, they are the teachings of strangers. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles, or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Oh, is that what I sound like? What I like about this is like, you know, he says like apostates. We all know what they are. 
And then, like, as a witness, I would think, I'd be like, I actually don't know what an apostate is, really. Like, think about it. You avoid them so much that you don't actually know what one is. <laughs> and I didn't really know what apostasy maybe even was, actually, until I got an email uh, from an apostate. And, it, like, I was like, oh, well, this must be an apostate email because it's making me think critically about my religion. Ah! But that's one of the powerful things about apostates is because they never picture them or depict their actual arguments. Because of that, you don't actually know what an apostate is as a witness. But for people like us who are trying to find some way to uh, wake people up, either, like, individually or maybe, like, through the media or through campaigns and stuff, uh, I think this is actually a really important thing that we can use to our advantage. Because all they do, and you know he does it here, is, is they basically say, apostates say all these crazy things, and then they rarely say what the crazy things are, and especially they will not portray the crazy things the way we would actually portray them. So I think that we can catch people off guard with just not playing into their handbooks and not, not doing what I'm doing right now. Oops. But I mean more with like direct engagement. Like if you were, if you were talking to... Uh, if, maybe if you're PMO and you're talking to your family members or you know, you're know you out and you're just trying to uh, talk to your family members who are still in, I think if you don't frame things the way Watchtower expects the witnesses to frame things, then you can kind of catch them off guard. And, you know, that might only be for five seconds before the iron shutters come down. But, I mean, that five seconds, I mean, that they will remember that forever. Some examples of their strange teachings are that the faithful slave protects pedophiles. Pretty pretty crazy to bring this up, I have to say. Now, the way they frame this is, no, no, he's not going to re respond to anything. He's not going to, like, give them the argumentation uh, as to why they don't. He's just going to say, they say this crazy thing that I murdered my neighbor yesterday over at 305 Not Murdered Lane. Anyway, another thing that people say about me, and then like, but he's never going to refute it. Uh, so that, I think, is not smart. And as much as I think, like, the video uh, propaganda they do is, is, is good later, this stuff uh, definitely sticks out like a sore thumb. It's cleverly worded because you have to realize that, like, every conspiracy theory, usually at some level, will get into this realm of child sacrifice or being a thing. And you see that with QAnon, right? Where they just will openly accuse people they disagree with as being pedophiles. Uh, it's really crazy. And it happens just online with like doxing shit. Uh, and because these groups are gaining a lot more visibility in the media, I think that can make it easier for honest, good faith attempts at correcting these issues to be drowned out and dismissed as conspiracy. Now, thankfully, uh, we are one of those good faith critics. Like, there really is an issue. It's been proven time and time again in court. We've had governing potty members on the stand testify to this kind of shit. This isn't that, but Watchtower wants its members to think it's that, <laughs> when really they're the QAnon. No you, reverse Uno card. The actual criticism that activists and whistleblowers have is the insufficient child protection laws that allow child sex abuse to happen more often and allows the victim to be uh, completely shut out of the system of support. Uh, it might force them to confront their abuser. You know, a million horrible things can happen to the victim. Meanwhile, the perpetrator often is not reported to the police at the direction of Watchtower because they don't want things getting in the media and bringing reproach on Jehovah's name slash Stephen Lett's name, who is named uh, as a defendant in uh, ongoing litigation in New York, along with the other governing body member. So I wouldn't say that any, like, good faith activist is saying that Watchtower is permissive of pedophilia. Like, no, they're on the record that they think it's bad, obviously, but have churches been known to have issues with this? Yeah. Turns out uh, churches have this problem a lot, like the Southern Baptist Church, Catholic Church, uh, the difference is they will actually engage with the media, change their policies, and admit wrongdoing and apologize. Watchtower is small enough where there's not that much public pressure on them, so they get away with not doing this and, in fact, never having done it. Uh, they've never issued an apology, even when Jeffrey Jackson was on the stand. He gave one of those, I'm sorry you feel that way kind of comments. So are governing body members permissive towards pedophiles? No. But their policies and procedures of the organization 
allow a dangerous environment to persist. It makes those issues more likely. And when they do happen, uh, it makes them worse. It can compound them. It can make it so the person has access to more victims because their crimes aren't reported. You know, there's just a million holes in their system and Watchtower is very obstinate. Their heart has been hardened as it was Pharaoh in the old book. I, I lost track of any fancy words by the time I got to old book. Or that slave will exploit you so they can live lives of luxury. Again, completely misconstruing what is, I would say, a more moderate criticism of the organization. I think you'd have to get to like six or seven down the list before exploitative labor practices would be there. And you know what it is, they use uh, unpaid labor to do a bunch of weird stuff that benefits them. But I don't think anybody who's not like a weirdo thinks that the governing body lives a life of luxury. Like, I worked on the Warwick project. I saw where they live. It's like a nice luxury hotel room, like in like a business hotel. It's, it's nothing special. They don't live lives of luxury, but they know that one of the most common perceptions of cult is that it is inextricably tied with money, uh, even though that is often not the case. And I think one of the things that's good about stuff like QAnon and flat eartherism and stuff uh, gaining such prominence is that it's so decentralized that there's really no one person in it for the money. There can be grifters who start like a QAnon YouTube channel and talk about Q drops, but Q can't sell Q merchandise, right? Like, because he's anonymous. Turns out some people love power, power, influence, and get this, just genuinely believing that you're right. A lot of movements just start because people very impassionately uh, argue a thing. They say that a thing is going to happen and that they're right about it and they're very convincing. And so people believe them and the person believes themselves. And maybe at the point where they realize that they're not necessarily right, it's a little too late. They got a few too many people counting on them. And so they gotta try and keep the act together. I don't know that any of these guys have any semblance that they're incorrect. You know, I think that at the very least, they think they have the best religion. But anyway, no, this thing he's saying, uh, I don't think critics really say this. Anyway, my thing is, not only is this not really a criticism that most people have, uh, even if it was a criticism, it, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. And I wouldn't say, uh, you should leave Watchtower because they're exploiting your labor. I mean, that's reason enough to leave. You should actually be based as hell. You know what? No, I am, that's, I am gonna start saying that. No, it's just power and influence, and in my opinion, them genuinely believing it. Acts 2030 says that apostates speak twisted things. They do this in order to draw God's sheep away and make them followers of themselves. So, uh, this is, <laughs> hmm, hmm, okay, there are things we could get into. We're not gonna get into that. Generally, people don't leave and accumulate followers for themselves. I mean, in the social media presence of like, I get some followers on YouTube, yeah, that's not really me like starting my own religion and be like, as opposed to Watchtower, listen to my doctrines of the world. Like, no, I don't really have much of a message beyond like, aren't I funny? Please tell me in the comments. Are there some that break off from the religion and start their own little religion? Yes, it has been known to happen. Ing. Now. But frankly, the reason why I am never going to talk about who I'm talking about is because barely anybody knows about this shit. It doesn't matter. They don't really have that much sway in the larger XJW community, I don't think. Here's why I don't know if I love this video because I feel like it's revealing my off camera persona. Because, <laughs> like, I'm way more manic and um, uh, insane. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm, I'm farting a lot too. That's great. To their credit, uh, Watchtower doesn't know this shit either. They're just talking out of their ass. They've always said this same exact thing. And, you know, technically there are still Bible students around. Generally speaking, though, this content that, like, AXJWs make is, like, just to be there. It's just to exist as a resource. And I maintain that the absolute best stuff that anybody makes, people just recording selfie camera, telling their story about why they left, because human stories those can just penetrate any bias. Like, I think he's he's going to go on to talk about how liking a character in a movie might make you just start thinking critically about your pre-existing biases on, for example, uh, monogamy, like he's, he's gonna talk about later. Foreshadowing monogamy, my journey out of the polyamorous lifestyle. I don't know, it, it felt like, uh... <laughs> It felt like there was a joke there, and I don't think I found it. Give me your version of it in the comments if you think you're so great. So, like, 
No. People posting their experiences of cringy shit happening at the Kingdom Hall on TikTok is uh, not people seeking, like, power and influence over Jehovah's Witnesses so that they can get the followers instead. Like, ain't nobody out here trying to start a new governing body member. The, uh, new, no one's trying to start a new governing body member, as far as I know. Those are both bald-faced lies. It's kind of amazing that he says these things, and he's like, those are lies. And then he doesn't say, this is how we know they're not lies. <laughs> he's like, uh, trust us. They say these outlandish things. They're crazy. They're lies. And I'll tell you something else. We're moving on to the next subject. Something that's twisted is bent out of shape or distorted. They speak twisted things by leaving out vital details, taking things out of context or in some other way, manipulating a truth into a lie. Now here's the part where you've seen in my other videos where I'm like, oh, well then give us an example. Oh, well, they have heard this criticism and they have taken it under advisement and they say, I'll give you an example right here. And it's really specific and you'll definitely be able to double check and you're gonna lose your mind. This is, when I, this is where I screamed at my fucking TVs, buckle up. We must be careful about believing everything presented in the media about Jehovah's organization. Remember, the media is commonly motivated by prejudice, hatred, and a desire for profit. False and exaggerated news reports are very common. For example, in one European country, many people were indignant when an emotional press report stated that a young female witness died because she refused a blood transfusion. Were those the complete facts? No. The patient refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds, but she did agree to alternative non-blood medical management. This could have been implemented immediately and likely would have saved her life. However, the hospital delayed matters unnecessarily until it was too late. The press report didn't mention these facts. This is where I lost my fucking mind. So he says, they said in an emotional press release, by the way, um, what, what's the non-emotional way to put that? What's the both sides way to say girl dies because she refused a blood transfusion? They said that she died because she refused a blood transfusion. And she did. But what they didn't say is that she didn't refuse other stuff that <laughs> wouldn't have worked. This is all he's fucking saying. He's saying, like, yeah, she refused a blood transfusion, but she didn't refuse other different stuff <laughs> that involved blood. Like, here's the thing, fucking idiot. Not every hospital has access to these bloodless options. They are not always viable. In fact, they often are not. They are often are not a sound replacement. And when an emergency sets in and you need blood, you need it because you're dying and there isn't time to draw out the process like this dipshit saying. They always talk about this, like, well, we obviously have weeks to decide whether or not you'll need a blood transfusion, so we'll confer with the courts and you'll have a rebuttal in the newspaper and I will present it to the medical. It's like, no, no, no. Let me tell you something. When I was rushed <laughs> via the fucking ambulance because I was bleeding to death uh, and I needed a blood transfusion because I was dying, it was not uh, like... I <laughs> I was in and out of consciousness. I barely knew who I was. And all I could think of was, don't let me die. Not like this. Don't, don't let me die. Like this. Because I could feel myself dying. And in that dying moment, to think that they convinced some people, including this person, to fight the very will to live, uh, makes me, it honestly makes me angrier than just about anything in the world. It's horrific. And... If it is, like, the fucking last thing I do on Earth, I want to really put together some kind of report giving us some kind of numbers on how many people have died because of this stuff. Um, it's it's horrifying. What they're doing is kind of making it seem like the doctors are like, no, we're not going to do it your way. We don't want to. And it just isn't like that. They're the medical professional they're the ones qualified to say if something is going to save your life or if something is going to work or not. And you can't just say to the doctor, well, try it anyway, dummy. Like, who do these people think they are to mandate health, to mandate 
necessary life-saving medical treatment because they think the fucking Bible says that God doesn't want blood to go through a tube into your fucking veins to save your life. It's so, it's, it's awful. You know, what I have to um, stop myself from doing a lot is being like, it's so insulting to people's intelligence. I, I don't think that we should say that. And I'm saying, I, I'm saying this because I said it earlier and I'm like, ah shit, I'm gonna cut that out. Being in a high control group or a cult has nothing to do with intelligence. Smart people get roped into this stuff. I mean, look at like really intelligent people who get roped into Scientology. You have a evolutionary instinct in your brain to believe what you already believe and to protect that thing. It would be chaos if we were constantly changing our minds when presented with new information. So instead, we tend to protect the information we have already. That can be good but it can be exploited. And when you are on the precipice of maybe doubting, your brain is gonna do everything it can to believe the thing it already believes. So any witness watching this who is nodding their heads along and it will be millions of people around the world saying, yes, good point, well said. They're doing that because their brain needs that to happen. Uh, it's not even conscious. I don't know about you, but like when I woke up and started thinking back through my experiences, I, I was able to be like, well, yeah, I guess I never believed in that. But you just, you don't allow yourself to think of it in the moment. So, you know, it'll be interesting to hear a few months or, or years from now uh, from people who had a little bit of an aha moment listening to this talk. This is insulting and it is mean and it is manipulative. Uh, it is manipulating people's intelligence and their innate survival instincts. It is really bending uh, good sense and humanity uh, in order into something really exploitive and, and manipulative. By the way, a news report in Europe. For example, in one European country. These guys are such fucking cowards. They refuse to cite a source. This thing that they feel very morally justified in talking about how the, oh, the media didn't have all the facts. Show us. Demonstrate this. You watch YouTube, you watching this, it's, it's not fucking hard to find people refuting things that they've read. You know, you pull up the thing and you point out the things that are wrong. It's not that hard to do. It's just so cowardly. They don't want to be double checked, especially not in the thing, not in the talk where like they're talking about crazy apostate stuff that, you know, sounds very culty to outsiders. Let's discuss a second example of the voice of our fine shepherd, Jesus. Our fine shepherd is telling us not only to avoid sexual immorality, but also to flee from anything that could lead to it, such as immoral thoughts. Here Jesus makes clear that the only valid basis for divorce and remarriage in God's eyes is if a disloyal mate commits sexual immorality. But what's the voice of strangers of Satan's world telling us regarding divorce, adultery, and other forms of sexual immorality. No problem. It's your choice. You have the freedom to do what you want. This one is pretty weird, but also really upsetting. Uh, he talks about how divorce is becoming more normalized, and he uses the example of like, oh, maybe you see a movie, and in the movie, the husband is abusive. And this world's media is very skillful at presenting something bad as good. For example, in a movie, a female character might be portrayed as having a husband who is abusive. You like the woman, and you, you want her to find happiness. Then a handsome man starts working in her office, and he's so nice to her. There's an attraction between them. And the budding romance, bud, 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 budding romance is presented as something good. Soft background music makes it hard to consider her course to be bad. It's easy to keep watching and hope she leaves her marriage mate and runs off with her workmate. And usually that's what happens. So easily we can forget that Jehovah and Jesus hate adultery 
and unscriptural divorce. And so the wife seeks a relationship outside of the marriage, and she cheats on the husband, and because you're watching this movie and you like the character, you think, that wasn't so bad. And yeah, it wasn't, honestly. It really wasn't that. It sounds like it was good, and she needed a, a good fucking from a not mean guy. Right there, of course, goes to the issues that Jehovah's Witnesses have with keeping their members in abusive relationships. Women who are being abused aren't given the option to divorce their husbands. And I did I did a whole video on this like recently, so I, I won't I won't do that again. But you can see how harmful this is. How if somebody was watching this who was being abused, how would that make him or her feel? They would feel once again like they have no choice but to try and make it work with their abusive partner. And just think about the mental space of people who aren't just doing fine like people who are really struggling through some stuff the stuff that he's talking about like it makes you feel like shit and then because you don't want to give up your religion you just make yourself feel like shit and you blame yourself and you try and think of ways to like okay how do i improve on this i, I had a bad thought how do i make it sure that this doesn't happen or how do i fortify my resolve to not leave my abusive spouse and you can just see the kind of horrific situations that uh, arise. Anyway, it sounds like there's a bunch of fucking duds in the organization and women are trying to get out of those shitty marriages. So, hey, there you go. So I don't know why they're so concerned about this particular thing. I think they must have an increased amount of divorces, but it's not the kind of thing that they release numbers on. So it's not anything that I would have been able to like track. If you have any information on that, I'd love to hear from you though. My email is always in the description. The thing that's so striking is how they always portray the world saying, you have freedom, you have a choice. They always speak to, and I don't want to do any fucking editing on this because I just want to rant it and get it out. So I'm not going to go back and pull a bunch of clips. But if you're a witness, you have heard this before. But what's the voice of strangers of Satan's world telling us regarding divorce, adultery, and other forms of sexual immorality? No problem. It's your choice. You have the freedom to do what you want. Speaking of the idea of personal freedoms in very condescending tones, pff, imagine you could think for yourself and be free. Blah. At the same time, they talk about how, well, Jehovah doesn't force people to worship him. It's free will. So, like, are people free or aren't they? It seems like you hate the idea that they would make a decision that you disagree with. It seems like freedom to you, David Splain, is not the person, <laughs> it's Stephen Lett. Hey, no, David Splain, you get out of here, Stephen Lett, come back, I wasn't done talking to you. It seems like for you, freedom is when people just do what you tell them to do and shut up and act like sheep and don't ever Google you on YouTube. And I just... In fact, in order to make sexual immorality appear more innocent, it's often euphemized. Sexual perversion, such as homosexuality, is called an alternative lifestyle. Sexual perversion, such as homosexuality, they're playing all the hits tonight. And no, it's not euphemized as an alternative lifestyle. Nobody has called it that since like 1990. So their ideals of morality are from the 50s and their slang is from the 90s. By the time they die, they will just be figuring out who Kesha is. Many call getting married old-fashioned and see nothing wrong with living together without marriage. I said this in some other video, I don't remember which one, but my one uh, prediction for Watchtower is that they will put an increased focus on starting families and especially starting young families. And it is interesting that they are uh, refuting the idea that marriage itself is old-fashioned because of course they have been anti-marriage in the past they've been like hey don't get married unless you absolutely have to and unless you really got a fucking nut don't don't put a ring on it bro that's what it said in the washer i'm just quoting it. i'm reading it right here and i think that was at a time when they were really concerned about like new territory conquering new territory colonialism their favorite pastime um, but now i think they must be realizing that so many of their members are from children born into the religion who then get baptized and then you know are stuck and they're double stuck if they marry a witness because then you know oops extra tricky so i think that you might start to see that more and yeah that was just a little interesting point that i noted we're told that our focus should be on spiritual things and not on physical things. And this is especially true 
when thinking about where we are in the stream of time, in the final part of the final part of the last days. He said it! He said it! But what's the voice of strangers of this world on this subject? Exert yourself vigorously to acquire material possessions. Pursue things that will make your life comfortable, because that is what will bring you happiness. Yeah, the last thing is just like, oh, don't be all material. And <laughs> the only thing that was funny watching this with my friend is we were like, have you ever ever had a worldly person try and like pressure you to get nicer stuff like material things like you need a better job so you can get a better car you don't have the latest computer you have to get another gooder job at the big business factory downtown you know what a sheep is don't you dummy you stupid child you remember sheep you learned about them in school you might have even seen a sheep at a petting zoo or on a farm, like my brother and me. He's a weird, worldly businessman now and makes me a bunch of money. I feel bad for the governing body. Like, you know, if for some reason they're watching this, just like trolling YouTube, feeling good about their talk and they're watching this and they're like, oh, look at this fucking apostate copium over here. It's like, yeah, but you know what's nice is when I get kind of like, upset or bummed out i get to be kind of like loud and performative about it and i get to like smoke pot and it feels good and it's nice and fun and when you feel sad you have to uh, cover up sex crimes from the government but 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 but